so welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. This is the third series, the third seminar in the international seminar series about materiality and the social. And I'm really excited about this paper because um, I was privileged to read the PhD that this is from. So hey Chowett, big welcome to you. Um, talking about the PhD that I've had a preview of that does everything PhDs should do. It's exciting and important data and exciting and important use of theory. And that's the connection that we have across the group here. OK, so some commonalities in the theoretical sources we like and we use, uh, not necessarily topic overlaps. So uh, we said we'd do a little content warning, didn't we, H, that we will just mention we are going to talk about bodies, about sex and uh, references to uh, consensual and non-consensual sex. Is that enough of a content warning, do you think? Yeah, just time? about Pam. I'll cover it when I need to. Yeah, thank yeah. you. OK, great. All right. So we've got a 40 minute paper with some visuals, with some video. So that's wonderful. So welcome, H, and please take it away. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. It's a real pleasure to have been invited. And um, yeah, really grateful to share my work and grateful that you've come along. So it's Mercury retrograde for anyone that knows a bit of astrology. So we've had absolute tech nightmares, but I'm going to attempt to share my screen now. So hello, my name is H. Um, I recently completed a PhD project which uses uh, new materialism and the concept of the assemblage to research transsex. And in doing this, I developed a novel methodological approach which I term intimacy as method. Um, I'm going to try and begin by showing this uh, sort of like DIY collage that I made. It's a video essay that I made last year that talks about that approach. And then after that, I'll be talking about how I approach the analysis. So the, in the video, there is depictions of sex acts and genitals, like Pam said, and a brief mention of suicide and CSA. Now, also, just to say we've had a bit of difficulty sharing this YouTube video in the tech check. So Pam is going to send the YouTube link in the chat now. If you can't hear it through me sharing my screen, Feel free to just mute yourself and click on the link and watch it on YouTube on your own device. So, I've no volume I can't yet. Exactly Age. what I was thinking. Oh, yeah. Six That's years ago, I applied for this funded PhD in transsexualities. I guess I thought, well, they'll never give it to me anyway. I guess I thought, if they do, maybe I can do this differently. I guess I had in mind the hot, fresh memory of our writhing bodies in that club in Vauxhall, the feminist fisting workshop, the porn film festival when so many of us descended on the sex segregated spa, they gave up trying to separate us the trans pride after party turned four or more G. I guess I thought, I think I have something to say about trans sex. I guess what I felt was a hopeful shift, the tipping, 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 the transformative potential of queer and trans fucking, which is to say queer and trans art, which is to say queer and trans love. What I do remember is this. I remember I was about to retake my GCSE exams because school, which gave me nothing but a pathological fear of learning and an immediate shame response that accompanies me to this day in all public speaking, failed me and I left with only a handful. I remember the Pulse nightclub shooting gathering at the Pleasure Gardens to hold vigil. I remember buses to Bedford packed with queers and feminists, the immigrant-led movement for justice surrounding Yarl's Wood Women's Detention Centre, chanting, shut it down, shut it down. I remember King's Cross St Pancras Eurostar Terminal, people's hands glued to turnstiles, chanting, your borders kill, your borders kill, and rivers of crimson on the marble station floor. I remember the ads on the tube after Sisters Uncut closed the bridges of London, protesting the austerity-driven closures of domestic violence services supporting migrant women and women of colour. I remember the first inklings that something was wrong with my body. 
I remember opening the letter that said I'd been accepted for the PhD and linking my arms with the arms of my husband and dancing, dancing around the living room, crying, crying both, checking again and again to make sure I'd read it right. Now it's been six years and all of those and the six before it under Tory rule. It's been six years and five loved ones have died, too many by suicide. Brexit, then Trump, vast acceleration of climate crisis, planetary catastrophe, racist police bill, racist borders bill. Four diagnoses where there used to be none, but a 25% cut in budget and a hollowed out healthcare system not fit for purpose. Two admissions to the psych ward, one public consultation to reform the Gender Recognition Act, 100,000 responders thanks to trans people up and down the country holding pop-up cyber cafes. Even though most of us don't give a fuck about recognition and know that the insipid fight for rights excludes all but those who can benefit from them. Two thirds said fuck needing a diagnosis. Four in five said fuck the real life test. And five in six said fuck the spousal or veto. But fuck all changed anyway and now Britain's Equalities Watchdog is trying to backdoor a bathroom bill banning us from pissing in public without a recognition certificate, which is impossible to obtain thanks to the failed reform. 50 years since the GLF told us that rights and reform would never be enough, that gay liberation means revolutionary change, that with a coalition movement we could uproot the entire decaying and constricting ideology. By the way, did you know the first Rad Femmes were the anarcho fem queens of the GLF, who refused assimilation, fought misogyny in the movement and protested the Vietnam War? Half a century after the GLF, two heavyweight feminist academics, Ahmed and Butler, say it again, say it louder. Transphobia is fascism. Policing the borders of sex is about policing the borders of the nation. So-called gender criticality is anathema to feminist liberation. It's been six years and one global pandemic which proved once and for all that if the choice is the economy or the people, our leaders would rather see us die and capitalism survive. That if the choice is vaccinate the world or hoard wealth and intellectual property, you bet your ass they'll choose profit over people every time. A pandemic which saw folks desperate to return to work because the possibility of a swift, painful death from COVID was preferable to a long, slow death by poverty. Which saw disabled people as collateral damage. Do you know how weird it is when mates who'd swear they're not eugenicists say with reassuring relief, don't worry, it's only folks with pre-existing conditions who die which saw people who once asked, why should my taxpayers' money go on lazy benefit scroungers living the life of luxury, eat their words one letter at a time when universal credit left them starving? We've been telling you for years. Being trans and disabled in 2022 is writing this list and wondering if there's some horror I've forgotten to include. Yes, a lot can happen in six years. Consider this. Someone referred to an NHS gender identity clinic when I started might be receiving their first treatment just about now. I don't know what I was thinking when I decided to research trans sex. Because in the six years that's passed, I've lost faith in those words. I research trans sex. I. Who is this I? Atomized individuals are but a Eurocentric myth, says Hill Malatino. We trans folks lack the privilege of an uncomplicated I. Who is I? Descartes' I? The Cartesian I affirms itself, says Huria Bateja. I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am the one who decides. I think, therefore I am the one who dominates. I think, therefore I am the one who subjugates. I think, therefore I am a modern, virile, capitalist, imperialist man. I research transsex. Research. Descartes' I is a violent lie. The mind-body split split us from our interconnectedness and set in motion the Western project of knowledge. Modern rationality, says Anwar Salahuddin, saturates all disciplines in the westernised university. Every tool we're handed laden with implicit claims to rationality, universality, to binarist duality. Good research is rigorous, unbiased, sterile, dispassionate, says the hangover of epistemic superiority. 
this philosophy turned our world into an inanimate, inert repository of resources. Amitav Ghosh and Ashish Nandi and countless indigenous scholars know that eco-disaster and ethnocides are but the underside of a corrupt science, born of a worldview that believes in the absolute superiority of the human over the non-human and subhuman, of progress over tradition, of manly values over sensitivity. I research trans sex. Trans? Who is trans? Juno told me everyone is trans. Travis told me everyone is trans. I didn't really get it until suddenly I did. Trans only holds up if there's any certainty in cis. But guess what? Peek behind cis and you find more of the same. No one is cis. Jules Gill-Peterson tells us that cis isn't an identity. It's a diagnostic. A description of a system organised to subject people to the authority of institutions, the state, medicine, law and the university. Cis weren't even a thing till the invention of gender, 60 years ago, devised in a panic to rescue the rapidly failing sex binary. Whilst we're on it, this newfangled sex science was built on the medicalisation and forced surgeries of intersex children, something still practised today, so anyone with concerns about trans kids' access to medical intervention might want to redirect their resources to the intersex rights organisations fighting for bodily autonomy. Cis is not just a fiction, it's a racialised fiction. Genders are racial categories, because like Travis Alabanza tells it, trans people don't own misgendering. And like Marquise Bay says, blackness makes for gender trouble. Access to the privilege of normative genders, and indeed normative transgenders, confers proximity to whiteness. Gender's legibility falls along racial lines. Before what Huria Buteja calls the great colonial night, there was an extreme diversity of sex and gender relations. Is that what James Baldwin meant when he told Audre Lorde that the black sense of male and female is more sophisticated than the Western idea? Whilst careful not to romanticise or homogenise, we cannot ignore that our present day notion of trans, of feminism, emerged out of capitalist and colonial expansion. So, I research trans sex, but the conditions that have enabled those words to emerge have, in a very real sense, everything to do with colonialism and white supremacy, everything to do with neoliberal capitalism, everything to do with our current moment in time, which I hope we can all agree is pretty fucked. Who would have thought the sex bit of I research trans sex would be the least contentious, the most salvageable? How can I resist the imperialist imperatives of trans and research? How can I resist the academic lesson and detachment? Can I refuse? Can I refuse bodily and emotional detachment? Refuse the methods-driven, impact-obsessed neoliberal aims of the academy? Refuse the separation of ontology from epistemology from ethics? Can I refuse the way academia wants me to separate the research from the body that produced it and the context it got produced in? If academia demands detachment, but I refuse to be severed, what am I refusing to be severed from? The answer is love. I believe in love, in the Frarian value of love, its power to resist oppression, its absolute necessity to engage in dialogue, love as synonymous with dialogue. I believe that connection creates the conditions necessary for knowledge sharing, and I believe that without love we're fucked. I believe in love as a verb, not as bell hooks reminds us as in cathexis, but as an action which automatically assumes accountability and responsibility. Love, as Marianne Caber insists, as a requirement of principled struggle where hope, like love, is a practice, a discipline. I believe in creating the conditions for love's emergence and the emergence of a politics of revolutionary love as called forth by Huria Buteja. Love as in the love-based justice imagined by Kai Cheng Tong, which transforms violence into growth and repair. It is with this love, which is far from the saccharine sentimentality that late capitalism would have us define it, that I go about what I have come to call intimacy as method. Intimacy is what happens when we rupture and repair, when we storm and survive. 
This articulation of intimacy might be what Susan Stryker calls a trans method, one that disrupts existing objects and formations of knowledge by attaching itself to anything and operating on it, transforming it. Wherever a boundary is drawn, trans crosses it. It reconstitutes the relationship between here and there, this and that, object and other. A rupture and repair, never the same again. Intimacy has everything to do with interdependence and mutual aid, as in Hill Malatino's concept of an infrapolitical ethics of care, which enable us as co-constituted interdependent beings to repair, rebuild and cultivate resilience in the midst and aftermath of experiences of overwhelming negative affect. Intimacy as method is when I said, of course, when you asked to show me how your new chest was healing up, even though the ethics board insisted we all keep our clothes on, because bearing witness to this latest transformation was a vital act of love that I refused to reject. It's baking food with great intention before we meet. It's saying me too when you tell me about your CSA. It's letting the tears fall. It's breathing deep into where I feel it in my body, imagining myself with roots deep into the ground and branches strong and wide like I could weather anything, like I can contain the power of this horrific experience you share with me. Intimacy as method is taking that wanking tip home and trying it out and telling you about it when we next meet. Intimacy is what happens when our access needs are just met. It's what Mia Mingus describes as the closeness we feel when our disabled bodies feel safe and at ease with each other, the way our bodies relax and open. Access intimacy is a freeing, light, loving feeling. It's being told it's okay to pre-record this presentation in case I'm too sick or too autistic to present in real time. It's my colleague come housemate being my PA at this conference, enabling my first travel in years. Intimacy as method centres care. It is careful, as in full of care. Not self-care exactly, but collective care. Like Ruth Pierce's methodology for the marginalised. Like Leah Lakshmi Piepsner Samarasena's care work, which tells me to stop apologising for needing things to be slower, safer. That I can bring in disability without feeling like I'm writing about boring private things. It's a care that says it's okay to tell the conference attendees I am grieving. Intimacy as method takes up Hill Malatino's trans for trans praxis of love, which is many things, an ideal, a promise, an identifier, a way of flagging an ethic of being. It is anti-utopian, guiding a praxis of solidarity in, in the interregnum. It is about small acts guided by a commitment to trans love. Small acts that make life more livable in and through difficult circumstances. It's about being with and bearing with, about witnessing one another, being mirrors that avoid the cis-normative reflection that frames trans folk as too much, not enough, failed or not yet realised. Intimacy as method insists, as Stryker does, on an epistemic parity between the disparate knowledges of the scientist, the philosopher and the whore. Intimacy as method is a refusal to discredit what our own carnality can teach us. My refusal to deny the skills I learned from a decade of sex work. Intimacy as method is knowing that the people in my research can be better served by the customs of consent and rituals of aftercare that came from kink community than from university ethics procedures. Intimacy as method says, if you think your body is broken, I'm with you. If you think it's a gene, I'm with you. If in one breath you've always known and the next you never knew, I'm with you. Intimacy as method says, I don't really give a fuck about transsexualities per se, but if you knew you were gay before you knew you were a man, I'm with you. If the dream of that sweet het marriage or the glory hole or the dyke sex is what tipped it, I'm with you. I'm with you. Intimacy as method is knowing that everything is connected, that all things emerge relationally, ephemerally. Assemblage thinking comes easy to trans scholars because we know intimately how nature and culture are always assembling on the gridded dance floor of intelligibility. 
that matter is lively, that flesh matters, that humans aren't the sole arbiters of agency, how our very existence in the academy changes it. It's been six years, and I guess I still believe in the transformative healing potential of queer and trans fucking, which is to say queer and trans art, which is to say queer and trans love. What follows is a collage of trans fucking art love that I guess are what might be termed my findings. Let's devise hot medical role play where we process our gender identity clinic trauma by getting off. It's time for your appointment and you've cast me in the role of doctor and I must test to make sure your spontaneous erections are under control. They're not. And examine you to see if the titty skittles are working. They are. Or how about we use the queer art of asking to be seen and through our shared intention this energy dick will come from nowhere and it will enter this summoned cunt and even though we're both clothed this is PIV no doubt about it. Let's use a fat roll of cling film and wrap it tight around and around like a see-through miniskirt compressing everything from your waist to your thighs shaft and glands squished flat against your belly Frenulum facing up, facing your lover, ready for tongue flicking cunnilingus, grinding, scissoring. Let's read fucking trans women together and use it like a manual. And later you'll tell some researcher that the first time you fucked someone with the same body as you, it changed your life. That sleeping with another trans woman felt like your heart was being lifted up through your body, like it was the first time you'd had sex and actually enjoyed it. Or how about you chop this cucumber in half and you tell me you won't even have to hollow it out because you can start small dick fucking it and it will get wetter and wetter and you'll actually make a hole in it. And the fist pumping action as your tea hard clit sucks in and out of the hole you've made will make it feel like this was always how you're supposed to wank. Or what about strapping on with a dildo? Because ever since you found the words that work, like femme, like dyke, like pussy, you can fuck this way and enjoy it. And if you enjoy it enough, the leather straps of the harness grow like roots into your body, which drink your sexual energy and transform silicon into dick. And you're able to fuck with it, no question, it's a part of your body. Or how about the way your 100% top cis boyfriend never fails to remind you that being a gay bottom and having a vagina is like perfect, because he can just wake you up in the night and fuck you. And how he shows his trans solidarity by having the grinder profile for you both and arranging the group hookups with men he's screened by fucking with them to test if they're transphobic. Or how about when a sexological body worker invited you to introduce your genitals to someone who'd been told you were about to meet some genitals that you've never met before. And just this simple exercise of letting go of gendered assumptions allowed you to stay present for the first time in all your 60 years on this earth to genital touch from another which you tell me through sobs of gratitude and wonder. Or what about reinforcing the kitchen table so that once your phalloplasty is finally healed, you can fuck as hard as you like without breaking the furniture and you'll see the pleasure that's being taken, being given, that your trans cock has sent someone to this space and your mind will be blown. And how about whilst you're recovering from top surgery and you can't lay on your front to get yourself off, you find to your astonishment that you could make yourself come by direct stimulation Something that before you got rid of the tits was unthinkable. I'm not sure exactly what I'd imagined would come from this PhD. But it's coming to an end now. And through this terrifying moment in time, while so many of the words I once used have crumbled and the world seems to be crumbling, some things remain. Let's try and love ourselves back together. Let's rupture and repair and heal and grow strong and transform ourselves and each other and unfuck the world. My research question asked how trans people engage with and produce trans sexualities. Um, just as an aside, the original title for the project was How We Fuck, 
um, but the uh, like examination committee wouldn't let me have that title, um, so it had to get changed to a bit more of a wordy. But I think it's useful for how I structure the analysis later in the talk. Um, so I aimed firstly to explore what tools and practices we as trans people use to mediate a sexual experience, i.e., have sex, or to embody a sexual self, so to sort of feel sexy. And secondly, I aimed to explore the conditions that shape trans sex experiences and how these produce such a plurality of trans sex experience. So this diagram shows that question and those two aims as the practice of research which produces knowledge about trans sex. My refusal to separate the research from the body that produced it and the context it got produced in is the process of research. And this is what Fox and Aldred I, Pam and Nick, I'm going to say your names a lot, um, call a research assemblage, and this produces the transsex research and the transsex researcher. So what this means is that in addition to all the normal stuff that comes into social science inquiry, I zoom out and sort of expand what gets captured in the research to include the processes of research, such as how university ethics procedures enable and constrain research possibilities, how fears around reputational damage constrain what can be published, how memories shape what we do in the present, how things like climate crisis, transphobia, the pandemic, all seep in and assemble with the research, opening up and closing down what it can be, what it can do. And uh, that is what I term intimacy as method. And that's what I was trying to capture in that video. So to answer the research question, I generated data by holding one-to-one -one intimate encounters with trans participants where each encounter consisted of discussion, meditation, use of arts and crafts, and show and tell. During the intimate encounters, I shared my experience as a trans person with a sexual biography, and I also included my own creative outputs. The encounters were held in a log cabin nestled in the South Downs of East Sussex, and this is a picture of the inside of the cabin. So participants were invited to bring anything that made them feel comfortable in the space, and anything that might assist them in sharing their sex stories such as photos or personal ephemera, sex toys, safer sex supplies, prosthetics, outfits. And I documented these um, with people's consent and I, I've got a few of those on the next slide. So these intimate encounters were designed to be warm and safe, centering around connection, creativity and consent. To address the research process or research assemblage, that bottom bit of the diagram, I used an embodied and creative method that I called autophenomenography or intimate encounters with self. Um, I consistently wrote about and made art about the process of becoming a transsex researcher and the becoming of the research. So these included things like diary entries about an ethics lecture I was at, and my personal experience with a gender identity clinic, and um, art I made about trying out one of the novel masturbatory techniques that a participant told me about. And here's some of the uh, creative outputs that appeared in the um, research. Yes, yeah, so we made sort of like diagrams of our genitals, shared favourite sex toys, made comic strips of BDSM scenes, self-portraits, and so on. Okay, moving on to methods of analysis. <clears throat> so using the same data, which was the transcripts from those intimate encounters with other than self, I adopted two different methods of analysis to address the two aims of the research. And I called these thematic new materialist analysis, or TNMA, and assemblage analysis. So both of these analytic styles share the worldview that sees phenomena as assemblages of relationally contingent things. But the first is interested in the things themselves, and the second is interested in the conditions that affect how those things act. TNMA is used to explore the components, the themes, or the tools and practices, I call them, and assemblage analysis is used to explore how the flow of affect between these components open up and close down capacities within assemblages. So the TNMA produced findings addressing the first aim, the tools and practices of trans sex, and assemblage analysis produced findings addressing the second aim, the conditions that shape sexual experience and produce trans pregnancy. <clears throat> uh, so here's a quick summary of the TNMA findings. These are the, the tools and practices of trans sex or techniques of trans fucking. In the analysis, I distinguished between tools, a device, an implement, or a technology, and practices, the use of an idea, belief, or method, or a customary or habitual way of doing things. Though, of course, some components can be both a tool and a practice. 
For example, solo sex was used as a tool to demonstrate to a partner how to uh, give them pleasure, um, but also as a practice of self-love. Some of the tools and practices had uses besides the sexual or were only partly or sometimes relevant to the act of sex. For example, the use of a chest binder to aid in clothing fit. So to keep the focus of the analysis and the aim of research, I used two contextual qualifiers. Firstly, did this component facilitate or produce a solo, partnered or group sexual experience as defined by the participant? And secondly, did this component facilitate a sense of feeling more sexually embodied, more present, connected, aroused, desiring or desired? I grouped together tools and practices that seemed to fit together. For example, the use of a dildo, a cock pump and a chest binder were first coded as tools and then grouped as detachables. And so that's how we fuck with detachable toys and prosthetics. Importantly, the same tool or practice in one sexual assemblage might emerge in a different assemblage and produce an entirely different result depending on the conditions of its emergence. For example, the discursive practice, um, this is how we fuck with words, discursive practices I'm right there. Um, yeah, the discursive practice of renaming a body part uh, to more align with hegemonic gendered meanings was useful for some participants in some instances, like especially in early transition. But interestingly, as a practice, it ceased to become useful um, often as transition progressed and other affirming things assembled in that sex assemblage. And, and some participants reported that that discursive practice actually began to feel a bit dysphoric. So whilst I still see a real practical utility in presenting these tools and practices thematically in this way, I think of the first aim of the research now as answering a slightly different question, which is what are the human, non-human and more than human components of trans sex assemblages that plug into other components to produce trans sex? I think this question more closely attends to the flat ontology of assemblage theory and decenters human agency the reframing troubles the notion that underpins much of the neoliberal approach to contemporary sex advice, which views people as subjects with sole agency who can simply select an inert tool or practice or the latest hot trick and transform our sex lives. So by reframing the aim slightly, my hope is that the tools and practices which are presented here are understood as lively components of much broader assemblages, which may, given the right conditions, plug into other components to mediate a sexual experience or aid in embodying a sexual self. So the second aim builds on that first aim by showing how the tools and practices assemble to stabilize as a variety of events. It asks not what are the tools and practices trans people use, but how are these human, non-human and more than human things interacting to produce specific capacities of action and desire. And this is like, based heavily on lots of Fox and Audrey's work. Um, yeah, so these questions sort of arose, like why does a dildo restrict pleasure in one assemblage but expand it in another? How does a sex act that once caused great discomfort transform into a pleasurable or ecstatic experience? How can a lifelong desire to rid oneself of a particular bodily appendage transform into the deep and profound acceptance of parts that were there all along? How does the reconstruction of the material body radically transform the capacity for self-love or intimacy with others. This second aim considers these questions and asks what creates the conditions for such plurality of experience. In other words, regardless of what kind of transition narrative one holds, technologies one uses, or a label one identifies as, how do these components flex and shift? And what do they open up and close down when they do so? How do trans sex assemblages expand and contract to produce trans pluralities? And how might we utilize this dynamism for liberatory goals? So it was in thinking with this latter question <clears throat> that I became interested in reading the data through an assemblage analysis of movement. So within trans sex assemblages, there are a number of moving forces at play, and it is this movement that creates the conditions of possibility or what might be termed the micropolitics of the assemblage. That's the term that is in this paper by Fox and Audrey. So I used the micropolitics as an analytical tool to consider what creates the conditions for assemblages to expand and contract, stabilizing components, events, and identities as they do so. So in the diagram of this slide, 
I'm going to try and talk you through it. I depict this flow across two antagonistic axes. The horizontal axis from dark blue to light blue depicts forces that specify the capacity to affect or generalize the capacity to affect. And this is the Deleuze Guattarian territorialization and deterritorialization. The vertical axis from red to pink depicts forces that have an aggr aggregative effect or a singular effect, which is the Deleuze Guattarian molar and molecular. So assemblage analysis seeks to investigate these conditions to shed light on how these capacities to affect and be affected, diminish or, strength or strengthen bodies or a thing's power to act. Worth mentioning as well that this was a bit of a creative endeavor, an experiment really, to see what assemblage theory could do when I pushed my data through it. Could it help me make sense of the ways that trans folks show how things like genders and genitals are ontologically unstable categories that can radically transform? To demonstrate how I use this diagram, I will now attempt to illustrate it with an example of a transsex assemblage. I aim to show how one component, penis, assembles with various medical, social, cultural components, expanding and contracting that component's capacity to act in various ways. So observe the blue square on the right of the diagram. Specifying forces are at play when the component, penis, is restricted in its capacity to fuck because it is affected by estrogenic hormone therapy and does not become erect. And because it is affected by the territorializing forces of cultural discourse that insist soft penises are non-sexual penises. Observing the red square at the top, aggregative forces are at play when the component penis is affected by forces that aggregate all people with penises into the category man. So in the example so far, the capacity for the penis component of a transsex assemblage to be effective is being constrained, closed down and restricted by these two forces. First, it's aggregated into the man category and it's specified into the must be erect to fuck territory. The pink square at the bottom of the diagram is an opposing force that resists that categorization and specification. In this example, we could say that the penis component is affected by the singular force of the transdiscursive practice, one of the practices in the first aim, um, of renaming this body part girl dick, and that this force could be strong enough to resist the former man categorization. That force shifts the micropolitics of the transsex assemblage, creating new conditions of possibility. Not only does it disaggregate by insisting not all penises belong to men, but it also deterritorializes or generalizes, moving the flow of active of effective capacity towards the light blue square on the left. This generalizing force affects the girl dick by opening up the soft penis capacity to act in less specified ways. Perhaps assembling with other components, the mouth of a willing lesbian lover, for example, the conditions are now created for the production of the novel trans sex assemblage soft girl dick cunnilingus. This throwing out of the rule book is described by Fox and Aldred as an escape route which opens up hitherto untapped capacities for a body which may lead to the formation of novel assemblages. However, opposing this sort of radical line of flight is the force of re-territorialization depicted by that top arrow in the diagram. So the novel and expansive capacities begin once again to be aggregated into categories, closing down their capacities by re-specifying them. Fox and Aldred say in an assemblage, a body, an object or other relation is a territory established and fought over by these rival affects. So if I continue with that illustrated uh, example of the, the girl dick, the girl dick is aggregated now once again into the homogenous category trans woman and is affected by the re-territorializing force that restricts the penis component in new ways. For example, it is specified uh, by medical legal discourses that trans women must not desire to have or fuck penises. As with all territorializing forces, that too can be resisted when the conditions of the assemblage allow for further lines of flight. For example, um, a, a quite radical GP operating out of a gender identity clinic might be happy to prescribe Viagra, and this would be a singular affect, 
and it would deterritorialize the girl dick once more by producing a hard girl dick trans sex assemblage. So to summarize, I used this diagram to think about the constant forces affecting components of trans sex assemblages. In the example, we can see how something with no ontological status, status of its own, a penis, has its capacity to act, closed down, then opened up, and once again closed down, only to be opened up once more in this sort of concertina type motion of these opposing forces, which at once try to specify and conform to rules, then liberate and expand, only once again to be governed by new normativity and closed down. Um, I reckon I've got about three or four more minutes. Am I right for time, Pam? Just got like two more slides. Yeah, that would be perfect. Yeah, oh, three or four minutes would be perfect. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so um, this is how I tried to visualize the assemblage. So this is one example from the thesis. Um, in the thesis, I performed this type of assemblage analysis at four different scales. I did it at the individual component scale. Um, one component appeared in everyone's data, a dildo type thing. Uh, so I did it at that scale. I did it at the genital assemblage scale. I did it at the scale of a sex act. This is a sex act um, assemblage, the PIV sex. And I did it across one participant cycles. And one of the creative challenges of the thesis was presenting the analysis in a fixed form when assemblages belie fixity. Um, so here in this example, um, I'm showing the capacities and limitations of what a participant, Jamie's trans body can do. Jamie described how penis in vagina sex was once a dysphoria inducing unpleasant sex act, but one which lately had become his preferred way of having sex. So using assemblage analysis, I'm aiming here to consider how various components have expanded the capacity for Jamie's body to act in this new pleasureful way. Um, I think it sort of is noteworthy that I'm using these um, transcripts to sort of draw out what appear to be the components that affect the assemblage, but some parts of an assemblage may elude our awareness. For example, a subtle shift in an individual's biomedical mediators that we can't possibly know, uh, or a subconscious memory or a dream. And others may have affected the dynamism of the assemblage in ways we can't know, but might make an educated guess at. For example, Jamie didn't mention anything about the current political um, law reform that was happening, but it may have had an impact over that period of time, for example. So the sex event here is produced by an interrelated web of factors across material, social, biological, technological, psychological, relational, cultural, and symbolic realms. Um, so some of the discursive things that Jamie mentioned were starting to call his vagina a bonus hole, understanding that men can enjoy uh, penetration and having these new queer sex scripts. Um, there was a lot of uh, import put on the trans role models that had come into Jamie's life where he was able to see culturally that lots of men enjoyed having sex in this way. And so it sort of reframed that as a homoerotic encounter and he called himself a gay bottom. And there's also the material biophysiological stuff, the testosterone that was at normal male range, the top surgery that he'd had, the fact that him and his current cis male partner's bodies fit very well together. He'd attended to his uh, disability needs, had comfort in his physical space. Um, his partner was supportive, appreciated his trans body. They had great communication. Um, he'd been able to access therapy. Um, and he'd come to see his trans body as desirable. Um, through Grinder, he found that loads of gay men um, really wanted what he had to offer. Okay, this is my final slide. So, um, in summary, I think assemblage analysis did some really useful things. Not only did it explain why we are plural, but it also provided a tool for tracking how and where liberatory changes within sexual assemblages took place. So, the assemblage analysis showed that things body parts, genital configurations, sex acts, identities, become meaningful only through their connection with other human and non-human things. At all four scales in the analysis, the form, as in the specific material topography or fleshy configuration, and the function, what, how, and who might interact with that form, of a body or a body part or a sex toy, it varied significantly according to the types of connections it made with other body parts or bodies or things. So if we accept that a body's function, potential or meaning is entirely dependent on which other bodies it forms assemblages with, 
then analyzing what other components are assembled in the event and tracking how they are shaping the conditions of that experience is a unique approach to liberating transsex. These findings are significant because the material, the biological, the fleshy matter, the non-human detachables are all capable of having their function or meaning altered by tweaking various components within the assemblage and observing what new meanings or functions are produced. Across all four of the scales that I analyzed at, the assemblages um, all shared some significant things in the way that they shaped sexual experiences. Um, and those are the extent to which discursive scripts of cis-normativity, heteronormativity, or homonormativity are taken up or resisted, the presence and absence of societal internalized transphobia, the presence or absence of trans role models, the availability of trusting relationships and good comms with partners, lovers, healthcare providers, and therapists, the extent to which dysphoria is malleable and access to the tools to reduce dysphoria, access to individualized tailored medical interventions if desired, and clinicians who are available to receiving feedback and offer a collaborative approach, trans-inclusive sex education, and an attendance to incenting forms of oppression, um, oh, appropriate healthcare, and attendance to incenting forms of oppression, such as racism, ableism, and neuronormativity, or phobia, and classism. So that's the end of my slides. I welcome any questions, and um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, H. It's so wonderful to engage with it again. Uh, it's such exciting work. And I'm, I cut short what I was going to say at the start about just how many kicks it delivers to the academy, to knowledge, to knowledge production, to uh, research, to research ethics, to what words we can have in titles. And it's uh, such rich work. It feels so generous in what it contributes to academic thinking about our own practice as well as uh, the integrity it has. Oh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. I can see that other people did in the chat as well. And if people have got questions, comments and things they'd like to explore, they'll be really welcome.